lead us uh, through uh, the workshop today. And you'll need to unmute yourself, of course. But for young players there, Tony. All right, shall I just jump in? It'll actually be me leading the ah. uh, presentation today. Tony was so, why he was on mute, was it? <laughs> sorry about that, Councillor. No, okay, well, where, where you go? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the purpose of today's workshop is to discuss the draft local alcohol policy, which you would have received last week. Um, you'll recall that we had a workshop in February to discuss um, the current 2016 policy and to discuss feedback that we had received from the police, the um, licensing committee and inspectors. Um, just as a bit of background and a reminder, the purpose of local alcohol policies, so councils can choose whether to have one of these or not. Um, as I said before, the current policy was adopted in 2016 and it must be reviewed every six years. So uh, here we are again reviewing this. Um, licensing bodies must consider the LAP when they make decisions about uh, licensing applications. And the LAP has the ability to limit the location of licenses in particular areas or near certain types of sites. It can limit the density of licenses and it can impose conditions such as the one-way door condition. And the uh, sale and supply of alcohol um, policy uh, states that, oops, go back one, uh, that um, when producing a draft, councils must consider a number of things which are um, outlined here, such as the objectives and policies of its district plan, um, the demography of the district's residents and people who visit the district, and things like the nature and severity of alcohol-related problems. So I'll just run through um, three changes, which uh, hopefully will be quite un um, uncontroversial. The first is that uh, we've included a remote sales provision, which states when alcohol can be bought online and delivered and who receives the delivery of alcohol. This acknowledges that there's been an increase in online alcohol sales uh, after COVID-19. Um, basically what is in the uh, draft policy reflects what's in the legislation. Um, we've put some additional clarity around the requirement for distances between proposed licensed premises and sensitive sites or other licensed premises. So um, the current policy talks about linear distance, so 100 metres, 5k from uh, proposed licensed premises. Um, we've expanded that to include a 360 degree radius, so just to enforce that we're talking about the impacts of that proposed premises um, on the environment or at large, not just what's in front of the proposed premises. And finally, the language has been simplified, so you'll notice that definitions have been moved out of the policy and into the definition section, and we've just tried to um, shorten sentences and make it a bit plainer for um, the public to understand. So coming up, there's uh, a number of changes where we uh, want specific feedback. The first is around the definition of site, which has been added. That was a comment made by a number of people about how that was lacking from the current policy. Um, we have included the narrow definition, which just includes the physical premises of the licensed um, premises uh, versus the broad definition which would be the legal title. Now, the issue with including the broad definition is that the legal title could also include other, like, uh, other premises such as a, um, a grocery store or a vape shop or anything like that. So that um, leads to other issues around having that broader definition. So that's why we've kept this narrow definition, but it does uh, mean that things like car parks would be excluded. I think they're often an issue when it comes to um, licensed premises. So feedback is requested on whether that narrow definition is preferred or whether you'd rather go with the broader one. I'm not sure whether you want to go through these at the end after my presentation or whether comments um, are welcome now. It's, well, can I just uh, say car parks are irrelevant because the, if there's a resource consent that authorises the premises to be um, on site, uh, a licensed premises to be on that location, um, the DLC does not consider car parks. Okay. Relevant. It's an RMA issue, not a DLC issue. And that has come up in several hearings. Okay. I think, I think Anthea, let's stay with uh, zoomed out. Let's stay in, in, in with the broad principles before we turn to your specific questions. Okay. 
So what are you inviting comment on, on there? So whether the narrow definition or the broader definition of site should be included. So whether it should be just the, um, the narrow so, definition. So, sorry, Anthea. In the, in the broader, so before we turn to these specific ones. Yes, yes. Uh, are there some broader changes in principle or some things born out of experience which has caused uh, for something other than just tidying up language or making, you know, uh, making clearer? Is there anything uh, else in the philosophical intent that's um, that you're proposing that's different or you'd like to? No, no, it's basically, I think the feedback from the February workshop was the council, that the uh, policy is working well. So it's really just tidying up some matters that were um, just a little bit problematic for the licensing committee or staff felt that needed to be tidied up. So there's nothing, um, no sort of broad change in direction in terms of the policy. Okay. So do elected members have any questions or comments around the fact that we are steady as she goes effectively and let's tidy up things born out of experience? We're, we're still comfortable with that? So Axel, could I just jump in and say that there are a number of things that different people have noted and particularly the DLC when we've been asked to interpret the lap or understand and decide what was intended that we have fed through um, that we would ask that the community clarify for us what is intended in certain areas. And, and that's one of the reasons behind this very thing on, on the screen. Um, and that came up in the Tamahiri situation where you had a cafe, a bottle store, and a, a very sizable restaurant all within the same premises. So what is the premises? Yeah. Uh, but also there's issues, um, uh, I think, um, and he skipped over it. She said that the 360 definition has brought clarity. In reality, it hasn't. Um, and when you have a square, if we can go back to that, I'm not sure if we saw it earlier, but no, we didn't. But if you look under the figure one in the, um, in the proposed bottle, you've got a square, and then you have a circle around it, and then you have a radius uh, at uh, right angles to uh, a side of the square. So if you've got a five kilometer radius, um, you don't end up with a circle around it, you end up with another um, square. If you're to five kilometers from any point is, is, a, is an extended square. So the definition, we would, in all honesty, um, both um, Michael, um, Cameron and I are on the same page on this. That new definition has brought mud to the waters as opposed to clarity. And we would reinterpret that diagram as DLC. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if there's a response to that specifically. We'll pick it up as we go. Um, uh, over to you, Tony and Anthea, but we can certainly address you now the specifics, starting with the, the definition of site. Yeah, uh, 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 I've got a comment. Yep. Sorry, I'm on my phone, so I don't know where to put my hand up. Is it okay to speak? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I guess following on from what um, Noel said about the, because I've got the same thing. I actually took the radius to be actually the centre of the building to get, to get that circle. But then, like, where is the centre of a building? And it's on all of those, all of those diagrams. Mr Chair, if I could just jump in there. Uh, look, we are aware that the diagram doesn't quite reflect um, the text, and that is something that... Um, we're working on and um, intend to have a pictorial representation that actually goes with what the text is saying, if that, if that helps. Because I think you're trying to say, Tony, if I may, uh, Axel, five kilometres from any, um, any point of the premises or the site or whatever we'd land on, but it's five kilometres from any point of the particular site or, or, or premises. Um, is it, sorry, isn't it, um, isn't it the distance from the closest point of those, those premises? Because I, I remember doing this when we did something in Tur Turco, um, <clears throat> and it, was, it needs to be measured from the closest point of that site to the um, facility. No, there's been many iterations of that, Jan, because it was 
at one stage we looked at going along the footpath around the corner and, and so on and then there was a straight line, straight line. yeah yeah and so the, the clarity here would be good yeah sorry i just want to extend onto that because we did not that we went through the um psychoactive sub substances and also the gambling by law it's the same thing as like how far is 100 meters from x y or z and from what part of the building and you know and using anything like a radius unless you don't take the exact center or something you could take from a move the circle in the building to where, wherever it suits you, potentially that can impact. So, yeah, I think it's just the same conversation we had around and perhaps the stuff that we, that we did on psychoactive substances and or the gambling bylaw around how we measure things and try to have some consistency across our policies would be helpful because mm -hmm. we have nutted this out over years and actually found some work, really workable um, solutions from those other ones, perhaps. And so that's a really good point. Have, have we picked up on a consistency of measurement or not? Or I can just jump in there, Mr. Chair. I, I think the uh, consistency is something that we definitely want to look at, although I guess this is slightly different in terms of um, a licensed premises, which might be a hall and, and an outside garden area, as opposed to the legal entity, which is the whole physical piece of land, which might be a, an acre in size, perhaps. So I take the point um, about consistency, although the alcohol it does give us a slightly more challenging situation that we have this licensed premise as such, such which is uh, you know, typically a building, might be a veranda and, and, and um, a garden area included, for example. So quite specific there to, to alcohol. What we want to do is take, um, as you say, Councillor, the distance from the closest point um, uh, or, or from either the legal entity, which might be the boundary of, of that um, site, whatever size it happens to be, or alternatively, the narrow definition of taking the actual physical uh, premises itself. So absolutely, we will take the measurement from whichever um, you recommend us to, and we will um, uh, make sure that the diagrams follow the text. I suppose the point we're just sort of um, asking is, would you would you feel that it would be better to go from, say, a boundary of a legal entity, the land, for example, or from the actual premises itself? And the, have I articulated that sort of? Yeah, you? great. Yeah. If, if I can um, pop yeah, in please. here, we ex we actually have a, a similar rule in the cow shed. Uh, I know it's not alcohol, but we're not allowed to have any um, any feed stored or certain things um, feed pad within 25 meters of an open open part of the plant, and you could actually do the, a similar thing here. You to me, you would do it from a doorway. So wherever they're leaving the premises, to me that would be. Um, and if they're leaving it in multiple areas, well then you would just shift it to the to whichever the closest point is to give you a um, a point of reference. Can I just talk about what happens in practical sense? Is it, you know, when we're talking a distance of five kilometers, whether it's 100 meters one way or another, it's not that significant in my view. The issue is what is the intent? And when you've got, you know, most people, uh, lawyers, people that come before us have got Google and they've done a line from that part of the building or the premises to their location. And whether it's to the building on the site or to the boundary of the site. Um, that's the distance they're talking about. So it's can we just keep it really simple? And so my way, my way of thinking is it's no, no, was it no less than five kilometres from any part of the subject site and whatever um, it is that's been measured. Um, I haven't got it up on screen in front of me, but really simple. And the, the DLC is guided by the by the lap. It is not. It, it doesn't have to um, give effect to. It must have regard to. Which is a. If you go to the RMA, it's it's a little bit of a lesser standard. It, it can ignore it at its peril and subject to um, to appeal, etc. But um, I wouldn't worry about going to a doorway or whatever. But to keep it higher level, from whether it's the building or whether it's the boundary of the site to whatever the issue is, five kilometres away. Yeah, I don't think there's any disagreement about that. Um, I think that's sensible and that's clear. Did you have a view yourself, though, Councillor Smith, on physical premise versus a legal title? 
Well, I, I go back to Tamahiri, and this caused a huge amount of angst because um, the kindergarten was within the 100 metres, but another, uh, I think the playground was outside the 100 metres if you took the building, but if you took the boundary, they were both adjacent too. So on a smaller area, when you get down to the 100, which comes up later on, but in this, this I don't have a problem with it's the site, um, because of, or the license premise or the premises to be licensed, that, that would be suitable for me because we can look at the plan and say, okay, that building's in that corner of the site. If you go to a, you know, like there's premises out here that uh, function center on a 10 acre block, do you take the whole 10 acre block or do you take the building, which could be half a kilometer from um, one side of the, the site? So I, I would really be guided to, I'd rather like to implement what the community wants. I'm just trying to explain what some of the nuances that we've experienced. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Captain Patterson? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you, um, I'd support the physical premises, but if you're working on a radius, you've got to have a centre point. So you can't go from the outsides of the building, you either go, to go from the centre of those physical premises. If you're going to have a radius, you can't move, move a radius around the outside of a building. Really, otherwise you've got a number of radiuses on each corner. So the, the, the nominal centre of the... Yeah, of the physical premises. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that should be pretty easy to determine. Um, so. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah, that will, it'll be subject to challenge. Um, to me, I just think... No, no part of the building, uh, no part of the proposed license premises uh, is, is less than five kilometres from the end point because it, if you've got a funny shaped building and a lot of license premises, that you, and you would know these, you do, they are funny shapes and who sets the nominal and then if there's a disagreement. Um, but, but as I say, at the moment, I would interpret 4.9 and 5.1 to be five kilometres, probably. Yeah. But is there broad agreement? I think I'm hearing that it's the premise, not the legal title for this point. You were comfortable with that? Yeah. Yes. yes, you have agreement. Yeah. Moving okay. on. Can, if I can suggest, it. Mr Chair, we, if on that, based on that, we'll just make sure that the, the image reflects maybe we take away the circle, but the image reflects the distance from the premises. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We'll sort yeah. that out. And could you also include one off the, uh, an arrow off the um, corner point, Tony? Yep. Yep, so it shows that not only from the side, but the ends. Cool, got you. Anthea, second point. Great. Uh, the second point is around the maximum trading hours for off licenses. So in the last workshop, elected members requested that this was reduced to 9pm. Uh, I think the rationale behind this was that supermarkets closed at 9pm. However, um, there is one district supermarket that closes at 10pm. So if we did reduce it to 9, that might open up an issue if there were any future supermarkets wanting to close at 10. So the feedback we're requesting is whether you want the... Um, current maximum trading hours to remain from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. or whether you do want to uh, pull that, that back to 9 p.m. Any comments? I think we should leave it the way it is, 7 to 10. So do I, Axel. Yes. It is causes too much to, hassle. Is that just to include that supermarket, though? No, but there's other premises, Jan, that that are combined, and it, it, you're just you're just opening up a can of worms for yourselves. And I just say that I I'm pleased to hear those who are commenting that leave it alone. Uh, if you do not leave it alone, the supermarket industry has caused hell around the yeah. country, and I know Auckland has been going for nearly, I think it's six or eight years to get a lap in place. They've spent millions of dollars in fighting the legals and they are all coming from the supermarket and the liquor chains. So if you try to reduce what you've got, you will buy a fight immediately with the supermarkets. And having met Mr. Braggins from the uh, uh, countdown uh, in a hearing, um, 
he took the uh, appeal to the Supreme Court against this council. Um, yep. Yeah. No, not sorry, the Court of Appeal, sorry, not the Supreme Court. Yeah. Court of appeal. Fair enough. Yeah. Anyone to the contrary? Anyone to the contrary? Uh, yeah. You leave it as is. Okay. Great. Yeah, point. Number three, and we're still on page three uh, of the agenda of the week pre reading. Okay, so this is around the areas of future demand. Um, there's been comments around ensuring that the LAP um, can cover any new areas where there may be growth. So looking at the proposed district plan uh, on the slide show in front of you, it'll have, um, there's a list of those areas that do allow commercial activities. And we also acknowledge that there's other areas that are experiencing growth, such as Tamahiri. Um, so the feedback around this is whether elected members do want additional restrictions within the LAP um, in these areas, such as limits on the number of licensed premises. Um, when I make this point, I'd say that the local alcohol policy does um, have teeth, even if um, areas aren't specifically named. Um, yeah, I'd, just seeking feedback on, on what exactly elected members would like to see in this area in terms of um, those locations that are growing in the district. Well, I, I'm sorry to correct you. It does have teeth on the, where they can be located, but in a general sense, the LAP says that if it's um, commercial um, uh, areas uh, or business zone and or by resource consent. Now, in Tamahiri, where we had our first real challenge on this issue, the, there was a business zone for Tamahiri. So under the LAP, it was allowed. What threw out the bottle store there was the fact that there was a grocery store 40 metres away with an off licence. There were two kindergartens, a school, a playground, uh, and that was about it. That also threw it out. So it does not have teeth in the reality. This is the area. It, it's, it's around this area, like Tikofi is currently going through an application, so I won't talk about that. But you've got areas that have not been perceived. You've got Tam, uh, Taupri with a bottle store applied for at a service centre by resource consent, but it was inappropriate, and that's also subject to an appeal because we throw it out. So it's the location of premises as opposed to the proximity, which is reasonably well dealt with. Okay. This Thank is you. just for wholesalers, though, isn't it? For bottle stores, sorry. I don't mean it's not for venues, though, is it? Uh, this is around um, any license. kind of licensed premises. Okay, because I'm aware Kimahe Lakes may want to have a licensed restaurant. Um, Speedway want to create a wedding venue in Hartley, all out by Kimahe Lakes. So how would that affect them? I think the main issue is with bottle stores, but... Yeah. Um, so in Tabahiri, it was contemplated that there would be a restaurant, licensed restaurant, and that really wasn't the issue. It was suddenly you've got yeah. a bottle store that's been applied for, which was supposed to be a fine boutique winery, wine, uh, wine shop. When it came out at the hearing that it was within five minutes, it could be changed to a super liquor or a whatever. Oh, no. Because those owners had about a dozen super liquor stores in Auckland and the likes. And the community, after the event, when it was decided, actually wrote, several members wrote to the community, uh, the committee saying, thank you, we, did, we supported the fine wine shop, but we didn't mm. realise it could be changed immediately. So, to a wholesaler. Mm. so I think most people from the feedback we've had through these hearings is that in growth, they support licensed restaurants. And, and I think that's a good thing. It's the yeah. proliferation of the bottle stores that people are really concerned about. Yeah. I agree with you, no. And, and then the um, police and the Crown solicitor who, who gave training on this issue to all, all the DLCs in New Zealand show that uh, over 40% of bottle stores are fronts for money laundering and a number of other illegal activities. So I don't want to prejudge anyone, but they're only happening for a reason. 
Yeah, well, I think that's probably outside the scope of what we're dealing with here, but I've got three speakers. Uh, Jen, I'll come to you first. Um, thanks. Just, I noticed that uh, Lakeside was mentioned in this, in this part of the discussion, uh, and the commercial area for Lakeside will be right next to, well, as far as I know, um, will be right next to the school, the new primary school. So that could be something to consider in, in future. Uh, certainly, it's probably not going to be the greatest place for a bottle store. But then that would be captured by the current lap provisions. Mm. Thank you. Lisa? Thank you. Um, just using uh, people's wisdom, uh, I just saw uh, Bank Art Street in Raglan because that's uh, deemed, you know, for um, commercial activity. So can so that that means um, that there's the potential that someone could open a restaurant and have it a, or a cafe and have it as a licensed premises. Is that right? But would someone be able to open an off license there? Because that would be a really bad place. Yes and no. So yes, they could open a, a licensed restaurant. No, they couldn't open because Ragland is currently uh, has a ceiling on. Yeah, we've, oh, so so we, we've got we've got capacity, eh? No, so I don't. Do I have to worry about that? That given that that's being highlighted in here. Um, well, the, the unless there's a, a challenge to it at some stage, or, or council wants to lift the limits in those towns. They can't put new bottle stores in those commercial premises or within a, a distance of each other. Um, but the licensed restaurant could open up in that Bank Art Street area. Okay, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Maxine? Um, kia ora. Thank you. Um, just how do we deal then with um, sports clubs uh, that might be next to a school or a kindergarten or you know, in a semi-residential sort of area where everything's close to, to each other. Hmm. They don't sell wholesale, do they? I don't know. I don't drink, so I don't know. But I'm just thinking, trying to they're think. Not, they're not, I don't think they're supposed to sell wholesale. They're, they're, they're not supposed to have a bottle shop connected to a sports club, are they? No. Uh, uh, no, you can't get a new off license, but if a club held a an off license uh, prior to the 2012 Act coming into being, they are able to retain that. I think, if I remember correctly, one has lost theirs because they let their license lapse and they can't get another one. Yeah. So they can. So they cannot get a a, a club can have a, a club mm -hmm. license, but they cannot have an off license. They cannot mm -hmm. sell for takeaway consumption. Okay. So if it existed in the past, um, and then there's a kinding just down the road, or a kohanga down the road, or a new school or something, that's it, it's okay. Yeah, if if that establishes after the club was granted their license, that's okay. Okay, thank you. Because they should have done their due diligence. Oh, sorry, just one more. Sorry, um, Mr. Chairman, just one more question. So does that mean? Just if you look at the reverse of it, if there is a place with a um, with a license, an existing license, does that mean that um, some of the other areas that we've talked about, you know, schools, kindies, churches, all the, all that sort of thing, they cannot um, build within a certain distance from where a license is granted? Is that no. the reverse of this? No. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, sorry, it takes a while on my phone to find the bit of things. Um, yeah, no, good. A um, couple of things. Just wanted to go back to, I just had a look at the, the gambling policy and just measuring, whether it's measuring five kilometres or whether it's measuring 100 metres for the various parts. The gambling um, by, uh, policy says, for um, it says, measured from the closest boundary point of each allotment or each um, property. So I don't know if that's helpful, but to me that means you could just go, so the closest point to each is that within 100 metres or the closest point within that is that within the five kilometres. That kind of makes quite some sensible sense as I'm figuring it out um, and maybe some consistency. And a couple of questions. So uh, Pocono, Tuoko and 
to Council to don't have a lid on the policy of how many outlets. Um, so the market demand supply reigns, and yet the other towns have. I, I, I think in these times of councils, you know, uh, equity, where we have district wide rating, um, and then the equity, that, that's actually not a position that we should continue going forward personally. Um, and I'm aware of how that came about and the agreements made around it. And I think that's also particularly as we're a growth area, even let's say, example, Raglan is, um, it's just been brought up with quite a lot of growth going on in different parts of our community, including those areas that have got caps on them. So we're not allowing free market trade. Um, I don't know if we can actually continue to have that stand in that position. And also, if we're going to have that level of service for some of our towns, but not the others, then um, I think that we need to be very clear about how do we explain that to our residents and ratepayers as to why. I agree just, with that. I agree with that position too. Yeah, so can I just tease out? So you, you're saying it's inequitable to have uh, limits in some towns uh, because it restrains the free market itself determining uh, access to alcohol. Right. Well, that's part of the equation, right? But it's, it's about level of service, about equity of, of how we all manage our, how our council has managed our towns as a whole as well. From um, either we go, either we, we're taking a, a stand where we want to limit the amount of outlets, which how I understand the Commerce of New Zealand, that's illegal to actually do that carte blanche without a really good reason. But if we're going to decide that as council, we believe that that's really important for the, and what the resident ratepayers want us to do, then it's all for one and one for all in all towns. But to actually then decide that particular towns do have that and other towns don't, then I, I'm fundamentally against that as a process and policy of, of council. And then on top of that, that third point of that is, we've got some of those towns just a huge, um, Lisa was talking about Raglan, but Raglan's got going to have it's a lot. It's kind of a boom town, you know, in terms of growth and more housing and things going on. So, I am concerned about the other side, where you might only have say three outlets in a town that doubles in size over time, and yet we we don't have any competition, right? Because if you've got a large town and only a few outlets, then we, for people consumers, if they want to go to those shops, they're going to be a lot easier to price it when they haven't, haven't got as much competition. So a lot of reasons why we've basically decided on this policy, which I don't think works going forward in our growth district. Okay, so that's a broader sort of uh, principle discussion. Uh, Noel, is that what you want to comment on? Yeah, I do. And the reality is going back, and, and I stayed out of the lap last time because I thought I didn't want to be judged during execution and I don't really know what I'm going to be doing at the end of this term. So, so I'm having a go while I can. But the reality is, with the greatest respect, Jackie, it shows your ignorance of really how the um, policy has been working for the communities such as Raglan, Narawahia and Huntley. And when we've had hearings in Raglan, uh, there has been absolute resistance about um, additional um, bottle stores uh, and uh, pe uh, people have lodged objections. And, and we don't get objections very often. They're, they're a thing that are, are rare in the DLC. So when people stand up and say, we don't want this, it's actually significant. So I, I, I get the issue about growth, but the last time around, the community was researched and they gave feedback, Huntley, Marawahia, Raglan didn't. You then had the supermarkets and the liquor industry saying, look, you've got growth in the north of your district. In fact, there's growth everywhere. But the reality is the, the appeal ended up with the northern towns being able to have more because they were growing at that stage significantly more than down here. Um, I get where Jackie's coming from and so far as but the community is not asking. If they come back, and I would say that it would be better to go out with what we've got and look at the feedback that we get on the current status. Uh, and in, under the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, Jackie, the communities can say whether they want more or not, and that is not contrary to the law. Um, it's quite clear what a lap was able to achieve. So it is quite lawful. Otherwise, it would have been tossed out at the uh, last appeal several years ago. Um, so, 
So, so just to clarify that, no, so you're saying that if all of the towns of Waikato District Council decided that they wanted to cap and have that cap in place, that would be a perfectly acceptable position to take. Uh, absolutely, if that's what the community, this is a community local yep. alcohol plan. That's that's what the community wants, and that's what if, if I remain on the DLC uh, or up until the end October, that's how it would be interpreted by the DLC. That that's what the community has wished for, and unless there's good reason to the contrary, the DLC would honour that uh, policy. Cool. Dan, do you have a comment on, on this topic? Uh, in as much as um, I believe that um, I'm happy to go out with this, uh, but I do believe the sentiment in Te Kaupara would be um, we have a, a, a much enlarged supermarket which has off license and we have uh, and, and bo a bottle store as well and um, the tavern which has an off license which is um, you know, a few hundred, a hundred or so metres away and that in a small, very small main street is sufficient. But I'm, I'm happy to go out with this and, and seek community input on it um, because that's how we get the information that we need. So I'm, I'm just wondering, um, and this is, I guess, a question for Anthea and, and Tony, do we actually, there's a much bigger principle here, much, much bigger discussion, I suppose. Um, how do we engage the community in that? How do we give the opportunity the opportunity for that discussion because I suspect that uh, a lot of communities won't even be aware that they have that that power, if you like, that their voice would be heard on this matter. Um, so whilst we don't necessarily want to cloud uh, a very specific consultation, it, it, it is actually extremely relevant. I guess the way we could do that is the story we tell around the local alcohol policy with the consultation. It's making it aware that there are um, restrictions in some areas like Raglan and in other areas like Te Kofita, um, there's more liberal uh, rules around what's allowed um, and the specific question could be asked as to whether the community agrees with that, whether they think there needs to be restrictions um, in other areas. Tony, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. I believe, I'm just thinking back on some of the questions we had in the, say, the gambling uh, review. I think by asking a, a, a good question, you do get a good response. And perhaps this is a case where we can construct a, a really good question that teases out that feeling from yeah. people. Do they want um, communities identified or, or not? So um, we could make it a, a, a quite a specific question in the consultation, seeking that um, input. Tony, can I just ask a question there? So you look at the live example of Tamahiri where everyone thought, right, it'll be a licensed restaurant and nobody had a problem with that really. Um, but then came the bottle store issue and there was objections. Do, does a community contemplate having a bottle store? Um, you look at Tekofi, licensed restaurant. There's seven shops that are, going, are currently being built. The proposal is one of those is to be a bottle store. And people... A bit concerned, um, and I won't be dealing. I, I don't deal with local applications, so you know that's the issue. The question that the DLC put to you guys is that within our smaller communities, do people envisage, you know, like in some we've got two or three shops that, if that's a commercial area and one of them wanted to change to a bottle store, is that what that community would want? And that's really the question that I would like asked, um, so to give guidance to the DLC that, you know, it's where should bottle stores be located? I think that's a good topic uh, and, and will be a good time to seek that um, feedback from the community because I don't think we know, and that's, that's come through Jackie and Jan's comments, we don't know. What we need to be very careful of, and I, and I say this with caution, uh, based on the Tamahiri experience, the Tamahiri or the TCC, the community committee, did not, respond to previous convers uh, consultations on laps because they thought it doesn't apply to us. Mm. Uh, then a commercial centre was built where previously there was none, and all of a sudden they ran into an issue of, of, uh, of not having thought about it and it yet going up against the regulations in place, simply because they hadn't given thought to it. Uh, they would have 
you know, some years earlier, could have given thought to it, but didn't think it was relevant. So if we do go down this path, we need to make sure that we don't uh, just uh, engage one side of the equation, you know, um, but actually that it's widely publicized so that we get a broad uh, input, not just for people who really, really favor it or people who really, really don't, um, you know, and, and therefore become motivated. We, we want a, a, broad, a broader catchment than we might normally have wanted for a policy such as this. Okay, um, does that fully answer question three? Uh, yes, I think so. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I think if we ask that specific question to the community around around where they want, it's really bottle stores I'm hearing rather than any um, on licenses. So we can craft something up and bring it back um, to yeah, the next let's one just, and recommit yeah, it. Let's just test that with elected members. Uh, are, are we are right that this is a bottle store related issue, right? So there's no one is saying, hey, if there's an existing commercial premise and then somebody else comes along later on and says, I might want to do a cafe here. No one has got any fixed view on that. It's more the bottle store situation. Would that be right? Standalone yeah. bottle store, isn't it? Or is it a grocery store that has a, uh, an off license? So is it- just, uh, is Yeah, it just off license. Straight out off license. Okay. Yeah, agree. Bottle store. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's useful. Uh, Marilyn? Yeah, look, uh, I know I've just come into this late, but I've probably picked up on the sentiment of it. The biggest issue with alcohol in our communities is, is not restaurants um, and eateries that are licensed. It generally comes from the number of bottle stores or off licenses, as they're more commonly known. So I'd be loath to actually open the door to any more until you've got a clear understanding on your communities and I mean the, all the communities, as to whether there is a, a, an overwhelming desire for them. Because the problem is, once you open that um, uh, genie's Aladdin, um, it's out, and you can't put it back in. So there's no saying, oh, we'll try that and see how it goes. There is no trying that and see how it goes. Once it's there, it's there. Now, just realise the people that generally go to the eateries and the restaurants are the people who, who are... I should say, on average, are probably responsible users of alcohol, uh, and so are the people at the, a lot of the people at the off license. But the problem is, it stems from those off licenses and who probably shouldn't ha have easy access to alcohol. Um, and that's not to try and control the community, but it's to try and save the community in some cases from the um, adverse effects that are driven out of a bottle store on every corner. Because I'm sure that's not what. Uh, any of our communities, whether old, new, or whatever, want. Mm. Yeah, we are very much talking, uh, you know, about the bottle stores, and I, th I think it's good. We, we're doing this as part of an overall review, so we're not targeting any particular applicant or anything like that. It's not a knee-jerk response to, um, you know, to an unexpected application. We're doing it as part of an overall view and getting our communities input. I think is entirely appropriate. Uh, before there are live applications in front of us. Um, okay, no, that's very useful. Okay, Anthea, you've got a point number four as well, special licences, uh, yeah. one way. Yes, so there's just been a uh, sentence removed from the, uh, uh, the special licences, one-way door restrictions. Um, this was due to the impact it would have on if there was a Rugby World Cup in the Northern Hemisphere, which I think is happening in a couple of years, it would have an impact, this uh, provision would have an impact on that. So um, by removing the one-way draw restriction, um, not applying any earlier than two hours prior to the conclusion of the event, then it would be left up to the DLC as to what provisions apply. Um, so we just want feedback on whether the uh, elected members are happy with that being removed. Any questions or comments? Jackie, you've still got your hand up, but I think it's a, a left over from your last question. Yeah, I tried to take it down. I can't seem to take it down my phone, sorry. It's all right. Any questions or comments uh, <laughs> post removal of the special license uh, sentence? I think it could be removed. Excellent. Okay, well, without okay. any... I'll keep that one out. Yep. 
Uh, Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, what does that mean? What's the one? I don't, I don't know what that means. The one-way door. It means that, say, in Raglan, every on-license that currently exists has this policy effective of midnight. So it means that no one, so anyone who goes leaves the premises uh, after midnight cannot come back to the premises. So no one is allowed into the premises in that last hour of trading. So you can't go um, pub crawling or you can't go in and out and uh, loading up with drink. And or, so basically, if you're in the premises, you stay there uh, or, or you go home. And if you go to another premises of Raglan, you can't get in anyway. So that's what it means is it, it stops the movement of people around the town and what was happening prior to us putting it there was fights and all sorts of nonsense in Bow Street. Um, but we've had this in now probably every premises for about six years. And yeah. apart from the Yacht Club, it has uh, tidied up the Raglan Bow Street uh, in, in, at, uh, late at night. So we're talking about removing it? No, this is for special licenses, oh. which is um, completely different to the, the normal on licenses, but that's, that's where you use it to in, in the last hour of, or two hours of trading, you can yep. have a one-way one door policy. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. No further comments, and I think uh, you've got support there, Anthea, for the Great. Management. Thank you. Um, just before I outline next steps, are there any other co general comments on any aspects of the policy that anyone has? Uh, can I raise two, please? Yes. So I sent these through to Tony and Tony have taken some notice of it and where it says suggested, I've got some suggested changes which I've sent out to all the councillors, but we added in um, about what is not a bottle store, a distillery, brewery or winery for the purpose of selling alcohol products produced on the premises. So what Michael Cameron uh, sent through and I supported was the distillery, brewery or winery and established primarily for the purposes of selling alcohol products produced on the premises. So what we've got at Raglan, we've got um, Workshop Brewery, and they made an application to sell uh, their alcohol from their premises there, where they brew the beer and can it and whatever. But they also asked for permission because they've got reciprocal arrangements with other craft brewers. And we were a little hesitant about that initially. And we came up with a suggestion which they bought into. And so, what we allowed was um, one condition, only alcohol made by the applicant or manufactured by other New Zealand craft brewers and supplied to the applicant in kegs shall be sold or, or supplied from the premises. For the purpose of clarity, alcohol received in kegs from other New Zealand craft breweries may be decanted on the premises and sold or supplied from the premises in smaller vessels. So my question to my colleagues is that, do you only want breweries distilleries uh, or wineries to sell their own products? Or would, would you allow, and I'm not advocating for this, but I'm just asking for clarity because we've done it uh, as a DLC. What you will see is that brewery at Raglan probably appeal if we do exactly what it's written at the moment. So uh, what we have done is allowed kegs to be supplied and then decanted with the reciprocal arrangements. So. I'm, I'm putting it to you, what do you want? Only allow what they uh, make on site or can they sell other products of a similar type from the premises? Uh, and that's, I, you know, I throw that open because, you know, we'll, we'll be guided by it, uh, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just wondering why you tied it to a type of packaging. In other words, uh, if it was wine, uh, wine, I guess, could, could work, but as long as supplied in the keg. Which would be well, because, it, because it was a brewery and, and it was uh, like a keg beer. So for um, like if it was a distillery, we might have barrels in there instead of, um, but, you know, we might think with, uh, you know, selling a uh, decanted distillery um, would might become a completely different thing and wine might be a different thing. So this was on a case by case basis. But under the current rules, it would have stopped us allowing that brewery to have these reciprocal arrangements and decanting that uh, those craft beers. So mm. this is an exception, and I think the law allows the DLC to have exceptions, but I would generally, as the DLC chair at the moment, um, 
like to work within the guidelines set by the community. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it open for the discussion, please. Yeah, uh, certainly speaking, personally, I'm, I'm comfortable with the direction of travel that the DLC has taken. Um, but yes, I think it, it probably uh, leaves itself uh, or should should be open to, uh, as you started with in your in your in, uh, intro, uh, wine and spirits also. Um, in which case, it has to be a different has to be phrased differently. Um, Councilor McGuire. Yeah, I think they should be able to uh, sell other things. So you might have a small winery that's down the road sort of thing and uh, want to sell their wine through that through that particular um, um, winery or beer. Um, yeah, I don't see any problem with it, personally. Thank you. Yeah, look, we've got a, a very um, large growing um, craft beer in New Zealand, and and I just want to congratulate Noel and his team on on the way they approach that actually, because I actually think that's probably the uh, a good way of doing it to actually uh, to support both the uh, craft brewer who's who's wanting to obviously sell his alcohol from his premises uh, to allow other craft brewers to do the same. So yeah, I think I I don't have an issue with it provided it is genuine craft beer. And not one of the multinationals that are, uh, you know, swap a crate sort of thing for a, uh, a dozen lion red or something like that. So you know, I think I think it's 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 like I'd call it like for like, I suppose in a way. So yeah, I think that was well done, Noel. Mm. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, and look, you could just take out distillery and winery um, if that's more problematic. But certainly with the craft beers, we thought that was a pragmatic way um, to do it. But. I, I, it needs to be asked. So I'm in, in your hands, obviously, and the community. No, I think I think the sentiment is is to to, to leave it wider, uh, you know, for alcoholic beverages generally, uh, but focusing on the craft rather than uh, you know to support local local uh, produced. Um, okay, uh, no voices to the contrary. So, uh, Tony, you, that, that's that and established primarily. You're happy. You understand that, Tony? Yes. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I've got one other issue, Mr. Chair. Yep. So yeah. the definition of new prem new licenses. So what we've actually got a, is a real quirk in the law. So if someone was to establish a cafe this year and it wasn't going so well for them, but it was in a lovely area, and at the moment it's, uh, where you can open a bottle store is undefined, uh, apart from those towns that are named. So we looked at a, a situation that came close to this and it was basically if the applicant had applied instead of uh, for a new license for a bottle store, had applied for a cafe, run it for a year, and then uh, applied to amend their license, the law would have make it a hell of a lot easier for them to do that. Uh, and in fact, there was very few reasons that we could stop it. So what the DLC has, is recommending is that adding to the definition of new licenses or uh, in the substance of the um, of the policy, inserting a change of the type of license will be considered an application for a new license. So if someone did establish a premises and then want to change from an on license to an off license, because it's an existing premises, there's only two things in the two criteria of about 10 or 11 that need to be considered by the DLC. And that's the suitability of the person. That's basically already been established um, by the granting of the on license a year before, so that's a given. And then you've got the hours that it would operate. Well, if it falls within the lap, we'd probably have to give it. So it would, uh, some people haven't really twigged onto it, but it came close to it under the one. And so Michael and I were talking about it, and we, we are recommending that the um, council consider clarifying that a change of the type of license will be considered a new, a new license. Uh, I'll leave it over to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, questions I, I, and points. Yeah, well, I can see. I sorry, I can see that that's a real um, that's a real way of sideways applying for something that's not intended. So, yeah, I, I'd I'd be supportive of some thinking around that. Uh, question for you, Councillor Smith. So, are there instances where a small and I I, re, I realise through the Tamahira hearing that small differences in wording can be important. You know, is it a, yeah, I'm going to say things that aren't right now, but like class two tavern versus class two, you know, something or other else. 
Are there minor changes like that which would be caught or would this effectively just catch the, the bigger changes, you know, from a cafe to an off-licence? Yeah, this is the higher level type of one licence. So you've got the off-licence, the on-licence, the special licence and the club licence, the four licences. So you wouldn't be really looking at club licence changes, but uh, an on-licence to an off-licence at that higher level. So, yeah, rather than looking at getting down into the detail. Okay. Yeah, so at that higher level, I'd, I'd be yeah. supportive of that as well. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts to the contrary? No, so that's got support uh, as well. Um, any other general matters from anybody? Something that hasn't been captured or we haven't talked about? Yeah, I have something, Axel. Yeah, there you go. And then uh, followed by Jan. So, um, so we're churches are established and regularly run in community halls, for example, so non-traditional church venues. Uh, how do we capture those? Do you want me to make a comment? Well, I guess we're talking about the policy. So I guess, you know, we're talking about it's easy to see a church with a, with a steeple and a you know, cross on top of it. That that's We should be X amount away from certain that, but a lot of the churches I know in the north, I don't know about everywhere else, where a lot of those churches are now using our community halls as an example. So, yeah, anyone who's got an opinion? So, so Jackie, I think there was one occasion where a, a modern church was operating out of a community hall, um, and we, just trying to think where it was, but we delayed the start time of Sunday to accommodate for those services. But that was because someone objected to it or the police or somebody was either an objection or opposition um, that we accommodated that uh, in the hours. I'm very sure we, we've dealt with one of those. I'm struggling to, to remember. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting point, though, because you're right. We've thought of churches as some sort of, you know, traditional brick and mortar thing, but actually a modern mm -hmm. church or, or as a, uh, you know, a place of worship. Uh, could actually, you know, be here one month and then they get cheaper rent somewhere else. So they go there for a bit and then the congregation grows a bit. So they go a third place. So it's not necessarily as permanent a located um, thing anymore. Um, do we need to give thought to that, Anthony and Tony? <laughs> if I could just jump in there, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, um, just the definition that we've placed on a place of worship um, uh, basically is a facility designed primarily for worship and related religious activities. So I guess the question is, do you feel that it should, um, that we should include in this, um, uh, in the lap, um, places of worship that aren't designed specifically for worship? In other words, the hall. I'm not sure how we can, you know, does that mean that they might have one religious ceremony there once a year or is it? I think yeah. it's more. It's, I think it's more the contrary. Actually, is making sure that when something pops up, then that doesn't preclude a whole lot of other stuff happening, and they might only be there for a couple of months while they're waiting on another premise to come available. Exactly. More, more yeah. Or alternatively, they might, you know, they might commit to, you know, that might be a regular place of worship, you know, long term, you know, for three or five years or whatever. Um, I think in these days and age, we're we know that you know the affordability of building a building like of worship might be out of their um, remit. So I guess I guess we have to be clear in terms of our definition. In all honesty, I think it's a red herring. Um, in that, if it's a church, it's a church. If it's a community facility that's used regularly or irregularly, um, and the community feels strongly about it, they have tended to come to the DLC, and it's been taken into consideration. Uh, All right, let's let's mull on that. Uh, Jackie, a second point? Yep. No, that, that's the only point. That's it. Okay. Anything from anybody else? Just on that point, um, yeah, so, look, I, I would say a, a church is a church. They're generally fairly well identified, if, if not by their style and their look. They certainly are by the sign outside. Um, so, yeah, if you start to try and um, allow community halls and facilities like that to be identified as churches. Um, yeah, you're really splitting hairs, I think. 
um, on setting yourself up to fail. As you said, they can be here today, gone tomorrow. They do move along. And one thing I can tell you about a lot of religions, they seem to be never short of money after they get themselves up and going. So they always end up finding their own premises and, and building, if not buying. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry, Jane, I um, have escaped my memory that you had your hand up. <laughs> Indeed. Um, look, let, we've spent an hour talking about this and we've asked a really wide range of questions. Uh, the comment was made earlier and I just want to re revisit that. Let's not forget that we're dealing with people when we're dealing with the community, we're dealing with lay people who don't necessarily um, have the time to read every single word and work out what what the understanding of it is. So the accompanying document, and I think um, Anthea was, was onto it, it needs to be really, really clear and it needs to highlight in our consultation documents, what do we want you to do? What's relevant to you? Um, and I think we, are, we need to get smarter about the way we do this because people are time poor um, and, and don't have this background information. So uh, let's highlight what we want them to look at and, and be very, very clear and very simple about it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, final comment, Maxine? Um, yeah, I just wanna, sorry, I just wanna give my support to the comments that um, Jackie made about um, places of worship and buildings may not necessarily look like um, buildings of worship. Just where I live in the Papakainga at, at Tūranga Waiwai, when you come into the Papakainga on the way down to the river, most people would not know that the first building you pass is um, Ahere, which is the church building. So it's not always obvious. Yeah. Okay, no, thank you. Point, point well made. And All right. Can I just yeah. offer once again that um, any document that's produced, I'm happy to read and give feedback on, um, not to change it, but just to add clarity. Look, and I'm very happy to help out too. Uh, yeah, you won't be adding to though, you'll be subtracting if I know you, uh, Councillor Sedgwick. <laughs> um, so that brings I'm, us, I'm all for simplicity, you know that. Um, so that brings us, I think, to your final slide, uh, Anthea, um, which is steps from here. And uh, the increasingly uh, infectious Melissa is uh, with us on screen. Um, bless you, that's some good sneezing going on there. Um, Bearing in mind the uh, the comments around that slightly broader philosophical questions around uh, bottle stores in particular, is this a sufficient time period for the consultation to be open or should it be longer, he said, leaving the answer? Uh, we can extend it if that's what elected members would like. Um, it's quite a tight time frame to turn it around the policy and regulatory committee in itself, but I'm confident that that can be done uh, this week. I, I would ask that that be, um, be thought about and uh, Mayor Allen will uh, as always <laughs> have a view on that but it's uh, you know it's just we, we, we're touching on some broader philosophical points not just the renewal of a lap and I just want people to have time. So Mayor Allen you're on mute. I shouldn't leave myself off mute. Hey um, so Anthony um, um, What's the time frame here? Sorry, I'm coming into this late for for hearing and um, and deliberations. So the ultimate goal was to have it done before the end of the training. So yeah, that's my um, ultimate goal too. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm asking. Um, a lot of it is out of our hands because it all depend on whether there's any appeals to the um, provisional policy. So there are a lot of yeah, there are a lot of unknowns, but our our goal is to get it through before. Early yeah, look, I would I would say set your sails and and um, try and get it done in this triennial. You don't want it dragging across into the next one because all of a sudden you'll have a handful of new people which we know are going to be there. They're going to want to know everything. Um, and uh, yeah, deal with what you can deal with now. So try and get it through. Thank you. Okay, any final points or um, at seven minutes over time, are we, are we done? Can I just say that the police have told the committee that we have one of the strongest laps in the country uh, and other people have looked at our lap and have congratulated the council through the DLC on the, um, I was going to say the balls, but the, um, the guts to go ahead with the lap where so many councils fell over. Uh, and I think 
standing back and actually having been able to work with the lap and implement it um, in decision making, uh, I've been generally well pleased um, and it's a credit to the council um, who put it in place. And I'm really pleased at what you're doing with it at the moment because it will make it easier for the DLC to, um, to utilize. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll close for today. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your, uh, your input in a constructive way of uh, 